Welcome to the Probate Nation. My name is Richard Ruddy and I'm the host of the show. People are living longer thanks to good health care and healthy lifestyles. But as we age, not everyone remains as sharp as they were years ago. And frequently a loved one, a son or a daughter, is called upon to take on the responsibility of helping an elderly parent or family member with financial and medical decisions. Execution of highly recommended legal documents in advance can allow you to provide that help without court oversight. But not everyone executes those documents, and when the time comes for you to help that loved one, you may need to take formal legal steps to get appointed to serve as the conservator and guardian. And in the process, you begin the living probate train ride. Our show tonight will look at the process in Stafford County to be appointed the conservator and guardian of an elderly adult who has financial resources. This process begins with a petition to the court, a guardian allowed investigation, court hearing, bonding, probate office qualification, and continues with the ongoing oversight by the local commissioner of accounts and others. We will also touch on some common problems and pitfalls that often arise in, in this particular living probate train line. This can be a challenging undertaking, so we are fortunate to have with us two elder law attorneys to guide us through this process in Stafford County. Our first guest is a partner at Whirl Dahlberg Jones & Yao, a general practice law firm with offices throughout Virginia. His elder law practice focuses on adult guardianship and conservatorship, including serving as a fiduciary for individuals. He is a certified GAL for both children and adults, and he serves on the Virginia Supreme Court's Court Improvement Work Group for Guardian and Litem. He has been named by Super Lawyer as a rising star from 2015 through 2018. Our second guest is an attorney with the Fredericksburg Law Firm of Curlo, Gold, and Josie. Her old elder law practice focuses on wills, estates, guardianships, and conservatorships. She was named a member of the Legal Elite by Virginia Business Magazine and a rising star by Super Lawyers. In her free time, she's been active for many years with numerous civic organizations, including the Rappahannock Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Thriving the Healing Center, and the Spotsylvania Education Foundation, to name just a few. Please welcome Matthew Yao and Michelle Moore. Thank well, guys, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having oh, it's us. It's our pleasure. Well, let's just jump right into this, you know, how we get this process going. Let's talk about some of these important legal decision-making documents. You know, Matthew, um, what are some of the more important medical decision-making documents that someone could sign in advance? Yes, for, for medical decisions, you definitely want to be looking at doing a medical power of attorney uh, as well as an advanced medical directive. Okay. Uh, and Rochelle, switching from medical to financial, what are the key financial documents that we, we could sign in advance? Uh, the key document would be a durable power of attorney to make financial decisions. Okay. Now, will the existence of these documents preclude the need to have a guardian or conservator appointed, Matthew? Uh, in most, most cases, yes. That, that's why you definitely want to be thinking about doing these documents. And I would share with our viewers, we have done, we have two programs we've done, one on advanced medical directives and one on durable financial power of attorney, which you might want to take a look at uh, to see what kind of, what these documents are all about. Well, let's turn to uh, what we call the legal proceedings of last resort. So, Michelle, Michelle, if, if someone becomes incapacitated such that they no longer can handle their estates and they, um, you know, and they don't have these documents signed, who can make decisions for them? Effectively, no one legally can make those decisions for them oh my. until a guardian or conservator is appointed. So we're, we're, we're kind of in no man's land. Correct. And in the absence of these documents, uh, like an advanced medical or financial power map, um, are there legal proceedings that we can initiate in order to get the, these, the, these powers to do these things? Absolutely. That's, that's when you'd be looking at doing a guardianship and or a conservatorship. Okay. Good. So what would be the purpose behind a guardianship, Rochelle? Uh, it's mainly to have someone appointed to handle the incapacitated individual's personal affairs, where they live, health care decisions, uh, residency requirements, things of that nature. So it's a personal care side. Correct. Okay. And then, now, Matt, what's the purpose behind a conservatorship proceeding? And the conservatorship is the other side of the coin. That's where you're given the ability to handle the person's finances and money. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's, let's switch gears and talk about the process to actually get that guardianship or conservatorship appointment. So the first thing I want to talk about is bonding. Um, there is a formal process to, to get someone appointed a guardian or conservator, but the key thing, of course, is that you have to be bonded. 
talk a little bit about what that is, Bob, for sure. Um, I almost describe it as an insurance policy. So if something happens and you don't fulfill your fiduciary duties, there's a bonding company that will essentially pay back to the, the ward um, whatever monies are misused. Okay. Um, now, all, all guardians have to be bonded, is that correct? Uh, right that is correct. Uh, whether or not uh, surety is required uh, is a separate issue. But yes, uh, so for guardians, um, surety actually is not required, so meaning they just have to make a promise uh, that they will uh, fulfill their duties. Um, you don't actually need to get an insurance agency. So bond bonding is not going to be sort of a, a barrier to somebody being appointed the guardian of somebody? Not for the guardian side of it. Okay. So Rochelle, let's switch gears on the conservative side. Um, can bonding pose a problem for someone being appointed? It can, because if the person petitioning um, is not bondable, let's say there are credit issues or bankruptcy or things of that nature that might affect them able to secure the bond, then mm -hmm. that could preclude them from being the person appointed as the conservator. So in your practice, so when you, before you start a conservatorship uh, petition, do you want to make sure that they can be bonded? The first thing I do is call the um, bonding company and make sure that they're qualified before I file the petition. Okay, that's a good point. We don't want to get too far down the road and find out that they get appointed and then they can't get bonded. Exactly. And we've wasted all that time. So Matt, let's talk a little bit about the formal process to initiate the efforts to become a conservator or guardian. So that takes the form of a petition. What do, we, what do we say in this petition in order to ask the court to act? Yes, the, so the petition, you're going to want to lay out um, a little bit about the person um, who you're saying is incapacitated and needs the guardian and conservator. So you're going to want to say their age, uh, where they live, um, you know, their current medical situation, why they need a guardian or conservator, mm -hmm. and, and also spell out what assets they may or may not have. Um, and hopefully put forward somebody that uh, you want the court to appoint as the guardian or conservator. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we believe this person's incapacitated. Rochelle, do we have to have a medical evaluation sort of attached with that petition? Is that something that's no normally done? Yes, you get the medical evaluation first and include that when you file the petition. Okay. So that. Uh, and is that generally submitted with the petition, or does that go under seal, or how does that generally matter? Normally, we submit the petition um, directly to the court, and then there would be an additional addendum that's provided and submitted under seal with the person's private information, social security number, uh, date of birth, things of that nature. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so the, we, we file the petition. Um, there's this thing called, we want to be appointed a guardian, mm -hmm. and then there's this thing called a guardian litem. Yes. And the people go, well, wait a second, I thought I was supposed to be the guardian. But, and so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that, Matt. You know, how, how is the, first off, how is a guardian litem selected? Yes, so a guardian litem is going to be an attorney that practices in that court. And um, how, how one is selected, well, if you know somebody you'd like to work with, uh, you can actually, in Stafford, you can uh, put forth your own um, and you would just want to, you know, make that request to the court. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, if, if you don't have anybody in particular, then um, you can just have the court appoint uh, whoever they want to. Okay. So, Rochelle, let's talk about the purpose and the role. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the purpose and role of the GAL. What, uh, well are, they, the, what are they doing? The GAL is essentially there to res represent the respondent's best interests, and there are certain statutory requirements that they have to do. So, they will actually serve the individual with the petition and the notice of the hearing. Mm -hmm. They have to do an independent investigation, um, and at the conclusion, they file a written report with the court setting forth what those recommendations are. So, they're basically like the eyes and ears of the court. Correct. Kind of get them up to speed. And to make sure the person's advised of their um, rights Statutory and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and uh, in order to allow the GAO to perform their duties, Matthew, um, uh, there's certain information that's needed. Can you kind of explain some of that stuff that might be needed? Yes, definitely. So you'll want to provide the guardian litem with all of the uh, pleadings that you filed with the court. That includes a copy of the petition, a um, copy of the medical evaluation you mm -hmm. submitted, and then you also want to make sure that they have uh, everybody's contact information so they can get a hold of everybody. So that contact information is for the relatives that the statute requires to be notified when you start this particular petition. Mm -hmm. Yes. Definitely. So that way they can, they can put in their two cents if they want to about mm -hmm. the whole process. Correct. Yep. Okay. Definitely. All right. So the next thing is the court hearing. Uh, so we file the petition. Uh, in Stafford, Cal Stafford County, Rochelle, how long does it take to get this in front of a judge? 
Um, it varies. It really depends on the petitioner's council schedule and the guardian item schedule. But in Stafford, once you have uh, the available dates for those two councils, then you can just contact chambers and get it scheduled pretty quickly with the court. Uh, we're lucky that in Stafford, the judges do these hearings at 8.30 in the morning, so before the regular docket starts for the court. So you can get in and out pretty quickly. That's really good. And who needs to appear when we actually have that hearing? Um, petitioner, the petitioning party, their counsel, the guardian ad litem, and the respondent is not required to appear, but they uh, often are there. Okay, okay. Now, uh, Matt, um, there's a thing called a standby, uh, standby guardian. Do they need to show up for that hearing too? Uh, typically, they don't need to. And they can if they want to, but uh, they're usually not required to show up. So the standby guardian is just someone that it, sometimes they'll name a petition to kind of back up the person that's petitioning to be the Right, person. right. And so since they're not primary, um, they won't need to appear usually. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think Rochelle kind of alluded to this, but how long does the hearing normally last, Matthew? Oh, the hearings, uh, these, I mean, if, they're, if it's not a contested uh, hearing and, and everybody agrees to who's being appointed, um, it, just a few minutes. Uh, it, it really won't take long. It's, it's pretty informal, pretty relaxed. And I understand sometimes that some of the judges will actually take you back into their chambers and actually do the hearing back there so you're not yeah. even in open court. Right, right, yeah. So, so depending on the judge, uh, how they want to do it, uh, some judges have it in, in the court, um, but not with anybody else, just, just you all um, before the regular docket starts. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some of the judges will actually have you back in the chambers. And it's, it's very nice, very informal. That sounds like a very, very relaxed atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but what you just mentioned, though, but what happens if the petition becomes contested? Right. So when it's contested, it gets a little trickier. Um, in that situation, you're going to want to talk to the clerk and uh, coordinate a trial date, let them know how long it's going to take, and uh, they'll, they'll find something for you. And in Stafford County, how far out are we looking to get a trial date typically for a... That, that's going to depend on the time you're wanting, uh, how much time you're wanting, but sure. it, probably a few months. Okay, okay. Um, well, then we get, we get to court, we have our hearing, it's not contested. Um, we need a thing, you know, the objective is to get a court order signed. So, um, is, the, is, the, is there something particular about this court order, Rochelle, that we want to bring to the attention of everybody? when you go in to get it signed? The order essentially should um, affirm everything that you've asked for in the petition. And in Stafford, uh, what the judges usually require is once we have the guardian ad litem report filed, then we'll send a draft copy of that order to judges' chambers so they can review it in advance of the hearing and be ready to go at the hearing. But this is not really a form document because it generally needs to be tailored for every situation. Correct. The petitioner's attorney would be preparing that. It's not like someone could download this off the internet. No, and no. And that would be unwise to do it so. It would not be wise at all. Yes. Um, now, uh, Rochelle, when the order is signed, does that give the person the authority to go out and start doing things? Nope. Um, they still have to go and meet with the probate clerk. Uh, we have a lovely probate clerk in Stafford and actually get qualified and um, do the bonding requirements and everything that's necessary and get that letter of qualification. Well, that sort of segues us over, Matthew, to talk about that process. So we've got our court order signed. We walk out of chambers or we walk out of the court before anyone else has shown up. And we're happy, and we have that order, but we need to go down to the probate office. So um, can we just walk in? Uh, they, uh, they typically do not take walk-in appointments. Um, so you'll want to call in advance, a schedule with the clerk, let them know that you'll be having court on a specific day and you'd like to qualify right after. That mm -hmm. makes things easier for everybody. So you work out in advance to make sure you kind of, so you can do it the same day, but you've got to make it arranged in advance. Right, you've got to make sure to make arrangements, yes. Okay. Now, in the case of conservatorship appointments, Rochelle, uh, we talked about the need for a bond. So does the bonding representative have to be present at that point when you get qualified as a conservator? In Stafford, generally, they want the bonding person there uh, okay. to sign the paperwork at the same time as the petitioner. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and can you tell me the bond, how is that determined? How, what's the size of the bond? How is that determined? It's usually based on what the guardian ad litem recommends that the bonding amount should be, um, and it's typically the value of the incapacitated person's assets and then uh, about one time their yearly income. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, so, Matthew, once I've done all this, I've been bonded, <clears throat> everybody's good, <clears throat> and, um, and uh, the probate clerk has sworn the person in, mm -hmm. what do we get to show that I have authority? Yeah, so the probate clerk will uh, give you what's called a letter of qualification, and that's a document that's going to show whether you're the guardian or conservator uh, for the person. Mm -hmm. um, it'll, it'll be uh, certified and with a raised seal, 
and you'll be able to use that um, for over whatever you need to do. So once you have that at hand, you are definitely good to go. That's when you're good to go. Go talk to the bank and deal with, with, the, with the various institutions. Exactly. Now, does, does the probate office give the, because a lot of people that are doing this, of course, have never done it before. Right. Um, do they give them any sort of instructions or uh, material to help them kind of get, the, get, get going? Yes, they, they give you a handbook and it, it kind of walks you through the process and gives you kind of the basics of what you need to be doing. Okay, yeah. and I think this is, this is what you share with me. Th thank mm -hmm. you, Matthew. The instructions to conservators of incapacitated persons. This is a, a very detailed book and also talks about guardians as well. Uh, but you get that when you walk out of the probate office uh, in Stafford County, they give you some guidance. Yes, It's definitely. a very, very detailed book. It runs about 40 or 50 pages with a lot of instructions, so it's mm -hmm. a very helpful tool. Yep. You'll definitely want to follow that. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about when none of this <coughs> happens for free, right? right. I mean, uh, somebody has to prepare the pleadings and someone has to take care of the, 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 the footwork here. So um, uh, let's talk about the fees. Rochelle, um, who pays for the attorney fees and costs incurred by the petitioner? Um, if the incapacitated individual's estate is large enough, then they would come from their estate. Otherwise, it would be the petitioner. Okay. And how about, we would also talked about, what if I had to incur, the GIL had to tra incur travel costs to go someplace? Uh, can those be paid for as well? Yeah, same way as the petitioner's fees, but I would recommend that um, counsel, petitioner's counsel go and get pre-approval from the court, have a hearing in advance to uh, let the judge know what the amount of those fees will most likely be and get those approved and put in that order um, that they'll be paid as well. Before you go and travel to the West Coast. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we don't want to <laughs> you're not going to get that plane ticket reimbursed. Uh, you want that money back. The guardian sure. item would not be happy. Now, how about the GAL fees and costs you know, that are incurred? Who pays for those? Uh, the respondent's estate. Um, if the respondent is indigent, if they don't have the enough funds, then the Commonwealth will actually pay for that or the petitioner. Okay. Now, Matthew, when they must talk, some, they're in, in the process of the GAL investigation, one of the things they're going to ask uh, the, the, the respondent is do they want to have their own attorney? Right. And so if they actually say yes and they hire own, their own attorney, there's those attorney fees as well. Right. So who pays for those fees? So as, along the same lines as with the GAL fees, uh, if the respondent has money, then it's going to come out of their estate. If they don't have money, then it will be paid by the Commonwealth. Okay. And then I guess the last thing is we have these medical evaluations that are done. Okay. They may have been done in advance or there might have been an independent medical evaluation. Who pays for those fees? Uh, the petitioner is going to need to pay for those fees. Uh, there are ways for the court, um, you can ask the court to approve those fees as well if needed in certain situations. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's, talk, let's turn to, you know, we, we, we've been appointed and we're off to the races to take care of things. We're off to the bank to get the account set up and um, contacting the, the doctors and so on. But we have these oversights. Okay, so uh, Michelle, let's talk about um, what are the reporting requirements? We have social service that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. We have to let them know who we are and so on. So tell us a little bit about the reporting requirements to the social services. So within six months of you qualifying as guardian, you would have to file your initial report with the Department of Social Services in Stafford. Okay. And then every 12 months thereafter. Okay. That's let, let them know that you're still working on the case and Correct. what's going on. Correct. Yeah, you're still the guardian and um, it's a very basic one-page report. It is a very simple form, mm -hmm. but you do need to file that. But you have to <laughs> file it, yes, that's important. Now, the, the other person that's actively involved overseeing things on the conservatorship side is the local commissioner of accounts. Yes. Tell us a little bit about our reporting requirements to that particular person. Right, so right off the bat, you're going to need to file an inventory, and that is due within uh, four months of qualifying. And so that'll lay out uh, what assets there are that you're dealing with uh, in the estate. And then uh, from there, you need to file an accounting uh, the first one, it's a shorter period, so it's actually due within six months. And then uh, each one after that is due, um, it's due 16 months, so it'll cover uh, 12 months uh, from the previous account, mm -hmm. and it's due within uh, 16 months, so. Okay. Yeah. And uh, just to share with our viewers, the Commissioner of Accounts down in Stafford is is uh, uh, Jeannie Donk. Yes. And uh, she's been on our show, and, uh, and actually uh, folks will be well well worth your time to take a look at that show and get her perspective on some of the things she's looking for as you make those types of filings. Um, all right, we, we, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward process right now, and I'm, I'm thinking that I don't really need a lawyer, uh, but, 
but there are some very common problems and pitfalls that arise in the course of this that really require someone with experience to be able to handle. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about that, and I'd ask you first, Rochelle, just to share with me some of your thoughts, some, some common problems and pitfalls people ought to be aware of in the course of this process? Well, one is, of course, that this is guided by the Virginia Code. So there are statutory requirements that have to be met, um, and a lot of lay people may not be familiar with that, mm -hmm. so it's important to have an attorney to walk you through those. Sure. Um, there can be issues with whether the individual um, is actually incapacitated, and there could be contest issues related to their capacity or their level of being able to participate. That's very um, true. We're dealing with family and family dynamics, so it may be that you want to be appointed as mom or dad's um, guardian or conservator and your brother wants to be appointed. So sometimes you run into issues with uh, dealing with the family members and sure. making sure that everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matthew, how about yourself? Anything you can share that's sort of some common problems and pitfalls you've seen in your practice? Yeah, so um, definitely something we were talking about was bond. Uh, you want to make sure that whoever's going to be the conservator can actually uh, be approved for the bond. Okay. Uh, so that's something you'll want to look into um, before you uh, go through all of this. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll want to make sure before you start that uh, the respondent is actually incapacitated. Um, you know, so having the right evaluations, um, you know, talking to them and, and you know, seeing what's going on uh, before you just kind of spring this on them. Sure, sure. Well, there's, there, there, those are good suggestions. Well, you know, we've covered a lot of material and we've we'll reached the point where you know, we have a little bit of time left, and I wanted to kind of get some, some closing comments, advice, suggestions you might want to share with folks uh, about this process. And so I, I'll turn to, to Rochelle first, you know, get your thoughts and some closing comments you might want to share. Absolutely. Um, well, obviously, the, the biggest priority is to try to get your legal documents in order in advance and to not have to pursue the guardianship and conservatorship. But once you do, it's important to hire counsel early. It does take a little bit of time mm -hmm. to get before the court, so you want to make sure that you've gotten the physician's evaluation. Sometimes that requires a little bit of uh, prodding. Um, and my big recommendation would be to sit down as a sort of a family unit and see this is what's going on with mom and dad. Um, what's the, the best way to proceed with this? You are going to have to notify family members um, of the proceedings. So mm -hmm. to be as transparent as possible from the get-go with everybody and make sure that everyone's reached a consensus and are on the same page. And that's all a good idea. Avoid a, a contest of any kind. Correct. Of course. Matthew, how about yourself? Your thoughts? Final I, thoughts. I, I think what I would want to emphasize is that this really is the last resort. Uh, you really want to avoid this, if at all possible. Um, by doing the, the powers of attorney and other documents that we talked about. Um, yeah, th this, these proceedings, it can be very costly, uh, especially if it's contested. Uh, that, that will um, cost you a lot of money and, and time and energy, a lot of stress. Uh, so you really want to try to do planning ahead of having to do these types of things. Sure. I think those are all, that's all good advice, I think, it, and especially uh, is having the family kind of meet and kind of figure out what they want to do and see if there's a consensus, and if there's not, figure out a way in which to, to bridge those differences so we mm -hmm. don't end up having to spend, you know, unnecessary legal fees if everybody has the best interests of the respondent in mind. Absolutely. So, well, I want to thank both of you for taking the time to come and visit with us today. You know, this is a and for, you know, for sharing your expertise. I mean, it's a great public service that you, you do for the Stafford County Circuit Court and for the citizens of Stafford County, and I want to thank you again for taking that time. And thank you for having thank us. Thank you for My pleasure. Thank you so much. You know, our population continues to get older every day. And with the passing of time, many of our elderly are no longer able to make good medical and financial decisions for themselves. There are several recommended legal documents that could be executed in advance to appoint someone to help you when that time comes. But many seniors have not taken advantage of that planning opportunity, and as a result, a living probate called a conservatorship and a guardianship may be necessary. As the discussion with our guests illustrates, there is much that will need to be considered and done to file and successfully prosecute a petition for a conservatorship, beginning with working with the family, filing the court petition, preparing the court order, and having that order entered by the court at the hearing, getting qualified in the probate office, and much more. This can and often is a complicated process and certainly is not a fill-in-the-blank kind of legal proceeding. We strongly recommend that you seek the advice and assistance of an attorney who has experience with these proceedings should you need to take the living probate train ride. This brings us to the conclusion of our show today on adult conservatorship and guardianship in Stafford County. Hope you found it informative and remember that replays of the show can be viewed 
on the Probate Nation website. On behalf of the Probate Nation, thank you for visiting with us.